and turn to that portion of James that we were looking at a few minutes ago, if you will. I was handed a note here uh, just before the hymn. It says, Pastor Spencer, I learned two things this week by contacting someone in the Tacoma BPC. Mr. and Mrs. David G. Fink, former members of this church, wife, Marilyn, can't read the next word, uh, Mr. Deal, must be Marilyn Deal, Mrs. Mr. Deal has cancer. They were out the church some weeks ago, not recently. He has been slowed down by his cancer. I'll try to get further details soon. So um, why don't we stop for just a moment and pray for Mr. Deal. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do pray for Mr. Deal who has cancer. We pray that you will have mercy upon him. We pray for your healing hand to be upon him also and that you will raise him back up to full health and strength. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, in your bulletins, as you are hopefully turning or have turned to James 2, remember the Creation Conference flyers. The purpose of this, there will be in the bulletin this week. They will be in the bulletin next week. And the following week is the Creation Conference. And this is not just to remind us to show up, although I hope you will, but to encourage you to be a witness. This is one of the very simplest ways of witnessing. Put this up someplace where other people can see it. Now, I know somebody may take it down. Don't worry about that. That's between them and God. Uh, but if you put it up, someone else might see it before they take it down. And so uh, we encourage you to do that so that we might invite others to be with us for this incredibly important conference that we're having on November 13th. Just a reminder, we encourage you to do that. And now as you take your Bibles and turn over to the book of James, we're in James chapter 2. And today is Reformation Sunday, and you probably wondered why I chose the particular text that I did out of James, since it seems to fly, at least from initial reading, uh, in our human way of thinking, much of which is often wrong, seems to fly in the face of the Reformation. But it does not fly in the face of the Reformation. In fact, it emphasizes for us the precise words which God gave to us, so that we might understand his truth and some very important divine principles 
which he uses and has used consistently throughout the history of the world. We're in James chapter 2, and I've read already verses 14 through 26, our text for the day. And as we said a moment ago, today is Reformation Sunday. When we speak of Reformation Sunday, we are making a declaration that we are not part of the Church of Rome, the harlot of Babylon. Instead, we are declaring that we are part of the Bride of Christ, the true Church, that body of believers on earth and in heaven that assert that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Reformation Sunday, a declaration that there is only one final authority, and that authority is the Bible. We are unlike Rome that holds to multiple co-equal authorities, the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, those things that include what is subcategorized under traditions, the councils, the writings of the early church fathers, the erroneous translations, the dogmas that they have proclaimed. Number two, its second line of authority, are the papal decrees, including the papal bulls and the ex cathedra pronouncements, where they claim that the Pope, when he makes a pronouncement from his chair, that's ex cathedra, that it is equal authority with the revelation of Scripture and to be held as equal authority by all the faithful. And number three, and last, and in Rome, it is certainly the least, the Bible. They have at least a triple authority, or three categories of authority, which they claim to hold to. But the first two, which are tradition and papal decrees, far outweigh the Bible when there's a conflict. For Rome, the Bible only bears great weight when the Roman organization thinks that it supports some aspect of their cultic heresies. And yes, it is a cult. It is something that claims to be Christian, but which has perverted the doctrine of salvation, thus placing it in the category of a cult, like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or any of the other cultic organizations out there that pretend to be Christian. Not merely a pagan religion. They don't claim to be Christian. Buddhism doesn't claim to be Christian. Hindu doesn't claim to be Christian. But those organizations which claim to be Christian and yet which have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we call it cultic. If the Bible is in disagreement with tradition and ex cathedra pronouncements by the Pope, the Bible always loses the contest in the mind of the faithful Roman Catholic. 494 years ago, on October 13, 1517, a brilliant Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther challenged the Romish practice of selling indulgences. Rome was in desperate need of money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. That's the cathedral that you see today. That's the seat of the Pope. That was being built at the time the Reformation burst forth. So Pope Leo X determined to raise money from European Catholics by broadening the sale of pieces of paper which were called indulgences. The Pope declared that for a certain amount of money you could have your sins forgiven. A Dominican monk by the name of Johann Tetzel aggressively entered Luther's territory raising funds. Each type of sin had a price. Adultery could be forgiven for a few coins. Murder could be forgiven for a few more coins. Each sin had a price. In fact, if you were willing to pay enough, you could have all your sins absolved and go straight to heaven at death with no stops at purgatory along the way. There was even an angle for those who had lost loved ones. You could buy the salvation of your loved one and spare them the flames of the Romish invention of purgatory. Just drop the coins in the box and immediately it would release the soul of your loved one from the burning of purgatory into the bliss of heaven. When Luther challenged indulgences by nailing his 95 theses to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg on the evening of All Saints Day, an evening, by the way, named by Rome as All Hallows' Evening, or All Sacred Evening, that's what Hallows means, because it's before All Hallows' Day, or All Saints' Day, we thus get our term Halloween. 
which actually has sucked in all the way back in the Middle Ages in the Romish church, has sucked in the practices of demonism. Please read that announcement in your bulletin again about not celebrating Halloween. If you read those two passages of scripture in Mark that I've listed and there are others, but I just put a couple of them in there, even little tiny children can be demon-possessed. It says so in the Bible. And what you do when you send your kids out trick-or-treating, you are opening them to occultic influence. No Christian with any wisdom or spiritual discernment will send his or her kids out trick-or-treating on Halloween. Enough of the announcement. Be with us tomorrow night for our fellowship dinner on Reformation Eve. So we get our word Halloween. But when Luther nailed those theses to the door, he lit the fire that broke into the first successful break from the Roman Catholic organization. There had been those who had gone before who had seen the abuses of the church, like Jan Hus, John Hus, in Bohemia. He was burned at the stake. John Wycliffe, the one known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, who wrote and wrote and wrote and challenged the church at Rome, and they wanted to kill him. Finally, he died. And years later, they dug up his bones and burned his bones and threw them into the river swift because they could not tolerate his teaching. Others like Wycliffe, who translated the scriptures into English. If you join us tonight, it's our fifth Sunday special. We'll be showing the film Wycliffe, God's Outlaw, and how he was tracked all over England and then all over Europe and had his writing seized and burned and seized and burned and yet he managed to translate the entire Bible on the run and it became the, the foundational work upon which the King James Bible was built. Folks, the Reformation is an incredible heritage. There were those who had gone before. They had challenged Rome, but Rome had crushed them. But when Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg of the church, All Saints Church, it lit a fire that Rome could not extinguish. He wrote them in Latin. The common man couldn't read Latin. He didn't mean for it to get out there to the public. He was, he was trying to debate the theologians on these issues. But somebody translated it, and the content blew the lid off of Rome. Luther pointed out that the Word of God does not teach salvation by indulgences. The Word of God teaches salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And that's why we sit here today is because others followed after him. There are others like Calvin and Knox and Zwingli, many who gave their life for the truth of the Scripture. At the heart of that debate was the issue of salvation. Oh, others carried it on in other lands. He began it there in Germany. But each of the reformers maintained that the Bible was the final authority, sola scriptura. That salvation was by grace alone, sola gratia. Through faith alone, sola fides. In Christ alone, sola Christus. Bible-believing Presbyterians are not ashamed to be called Protestants, those who protest the evils of Rome. We live in such a mushy age that even Bible-believing Christians are often timid and afraid to stand up and speak the truth. We are Protestants because we protest the evils of Rome. And that is our heritage, folks. We go back to these men of faith, many of whom were killed because they protested the evils of Rome. Now the protest of these early Protestants covered both the doctrinal and practical abuses of the church at Rome. For centuries, the papacy had held a stranglehold on those who were under its thumb. And central to that was the Mass. And you know how each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, I make it clear that we are not practicing Romish doctrine when we partake of the Lord's table. You see, Rome held that the faithful Roman Catholic man or woman would have to remain in terror of the church. Because at any moment, the church might withhold grace by refusing to perform one of the seven sacraments, primarily the Mass, which is a travesty of the Lord's table. 
Rome teaches even today that every time the Mass is said, Jesus Christ is re-sacrificed and the wine becomes in substance the blood of Christ and the bread becomes in substance the body of Christ. So it looks the same, but its substance has been changed. That's where that word transubstantiation comes from. It looks still the same, but in reality, it has been transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And so they speak of the sacrifice of the Mass. That somewhere in the world, there is always a Roman Catholic priest holding up the host. And they call it the host because Christ was the host of the table at the Lord's Supper. And so they hold up the cup with the wafer on top. And they call it the host. This is Jesus. And we are re-sacrificing him through the magic words of the priest. Yes, there was much to protest. Yes, there is still much to protest. Rome has not changed its central heresy of the Mass. It is still teaching a blasphemous, false salvation. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was sacrificed once and for all, never to be sacrificed again. And yet Rome claims that they have the magical power not only to re-sacrifice Christ, but if they refuse to give you your portion of the wafer, they have withheld the grace of God, for they say the Church of Rome is the conduit through which the grace of God flows, and so the grace of God can dispense it, and the, the Church can dispense it, and the Church can withhold it. That has held Roman Catholics in terror for centuries. They do not want to have the grace of God withheld from them, and yet they do not realize that what is actually happening by trusting the church to be the dispenser of God's grace, they are actually cementing their way to hell. Rome chooses to excommunicate a man. It means he will withhold the mass from him. If Rome withholds the Mass, it's withholding the grace of God, for only the Church can dispense God's grace. If it withholds the grace of God against a man who has offended the Holy Mother Church, it effectively guarantees his damnation in hell. Do we have something to protest? Indeed we do. And that's why the Protestant Reformation broke out as it did, and why Rome through the centuries has killed all those Bible-believing Christians whom it was able to kill. They do not want their authority and their money-making schemes challenged. Now one of the central passages under the debate, and it has been used viciously against the reformers and others who believe the Bible, is the text that we have read today. You see, the cry of the Reformation was justification by faith alone. But as we said before, Rome will use the Bible when it is for its own purposes. For many years they forbade Catholics from reading the Bible. And so Catholics would read it under cover of darkness. <laughs> they would read it secretly and find out some truths. Finally, the Roman Catholics realized this was working against them, the Church of Rome, and so they declared you can now read your Bible and so no Catholics read their Bible because it's okay. Reverse psychology there. But Rome, using the Bible for its own purposes, would point to James and declare, your own Bibles teach that justification is by works. And they'll quote James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. During the Reformation, Martin Luther in the heat of that battle once declared that James was a right straw epistle. He felt that James didn't, you know, declare as firmly as James ought to have declared that justification is by faith alone. James wasn't Paul writing Romans. James wasn't Paul writing Galatians. James wasn't Paul writing Ephesians. No, James is the weak epistle, Martin Luther declared. But I don't think that is so. What is the answer to that dilemma? As usual, learning the meaning of words and reading the entire context in which they are found will almost always give you the answer. Because scripture never contradicts itself, but we often contradict what scripture says because we don't understand the precise meaning of the words or the way in which the Holy Spirit used them in the context in which they are inspired. First, the meaning of the words. 
When anybody speaks of the death of Christ, and I came to this conclusion many years ago, in fact, in my examination by the Presbytery four years ago, um, I used this illustration with them because I think it's a very important way to understand the precision of Bible doctrine. When anyone speaks of the death of Christ, when anyone speaks of the cross, when anyone speaks of salvation or the means of salvation, you should have a drop-down chart pop up in your head. And on that chart, when you hear the cross of Christ, or you hear salvation, or you hear the death of Christ, you have this chart, and on that chart will be many different words, what I call the doctrines of the cross. On that chart you will see words such as justification, imputation, sanctification, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, remission, expiation, atonement, and a host of other words as well. These are all doctrines that are focused on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But they mean distinct things. Each deals with a different aspect of what our Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. They're a distinct one from another. And when we confuse them, it only results in theological chaos. Now, looking here at James chapter 2, to understand the apparent dilemma raised by our text in James, we need to understand the meaning, the precise meaning, of two of those words. There's much more we can say about these two words, but I want you to get the simple understanding of why these two words are distinct. When you look at the two words we're going to be dealing with, they are justification and imputation. And there is an essential distinction between them. James uses both of those words. Paul uses both of those words. We find them used throughout the New Testament. And in every case, they are clearly distinct and have a separate meaning one from another. Here in this passage, we see that James not only speaks of justification, but in verse 23 it says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So James understands the distinction between justification and imputation, and we'll see that in a moment. On the other hand, as we look at the two words, we'll find that there are an interrelatedness that ties us closely to the cross. And without having both these words in correct balance, the doctrines in correct balance, we do not have a biblical salvation presented. Let's start with imputation. If you don't keep these words apart, you're going to end up in the belly of Rome. Start with imputation. Imputation is actually a Greek bookkeeping term. Now, some of you are or have been accountants. Accountants use bookkeeping terms, which some of them are so obscure that most of us don't even know. But this comes to us from the world of Greek CPAs. It's the word legizomai. Legizomai is a word that deals with transferring something from one account over to another account. Now, some of you have bank accounts. This is easy to understand. Well, maybe some of you don't. <laughs> uh, but if you have bank accounts, you may have more than one. And you see that one is getting a little bit low for the purposes that you want to use that account for. So perhaps you'll take some money out of your savings account and put it into your checking account so that you will have the money necessary to do whatever it is that you plan to do. That's legizomai. You're transferring something from one account and transferring it to another account. So that the account that was in the deficit, was in the red, now is no longer in the red, but this account is now in the black. That is the word for imputation. And when we look at imputation in scripture, it's the word that God uses to speak of three transfers. Number one, transferring the sin of Adam to the entire human race. When Adam sinned, we all sinned. You and I are guilty of sin. We are born dead in trespasses and sins, not sick. We're not born righteous. We're born dead. That's step number one of imputation. 
The second way in which the Bible uses that is transferring the sins of men to Christ. Here's a debt being placed on Christ's account. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's the second transfer that takes place. The third way in which this word is used in the New Testament is the transfer of divine righteousness from the account of Jesus Christ to the account of those who believe. So that it's not merely a matter of our sins being canceled and we are in a state of neutrality. No, it is a transfer of divine righteousness to our accounts so that as God looks at us, we are righteous in Christ as he is the lens through which God looks at us who have placed our faith in him and we've had divine righteousness placed on our account. It's a bookkeeping term. It deals with the transfer of something from one account to another account. The second term is the term justification. And we find its verbal forms used frequently in the New Testament to justify. The Greek verb that is used here is dikaiao. Obviously quite a bit different than logizomai. They're not even related. This is not a bookkeeping term. It does not come to us from the office of an ancient Greek bookkeeper. This is a legal term from the courtroom of a judge. Now judges sometimes deal with economic matters, but it's a legal term used for the way in which a judge deals with all matters. A judge is a dikastes. Our verb is dikayao. When an accused stands before a judge, the judge has to do some things. The judge has to hear the evidence. The judge has to weigh the evidence. The judge needs to listen to the arguments of the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney or the public defender. And then as the judge takes all of that information into account, the final thing the judge has to do is he has to hand down a sentence. When he hands down the sentence, he cannot and he does not make the accused either guilty or innocent. As a matter of truth and fact, the accused is either guilty or innocent. When the judge hands down his sentence, what he is doing, he is declaring that the accused is innocent or guilty. It is a declaration. It's not a making of, it's a declaration that the accused is either innocent or guilty. Now obviously sometimes human judges make mistakes, sometimes they're crooked and perverse, and they do something on the basis of a bribe, but the divine judge never makes a mistake. When he declares innocence, or when he declares righteousness, it is because it is in fact true. The scripture presents Satan as the prosecuting attorney. In scripture he's called the accuser of the brethren. He stands before God pointing out our sins on an incessant basis. Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. John tells us that in 1 John chapter 2. He is the one who makes intercession on our behalf in the book of Hebrews and Romans. Who, he is the one who is our advocate with the Father. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan accuses us. Jesus Christ defends us. And on what basis does he defend us? He is our defense attorney. He points to the scars in his hands. He points to the wound in his side. He tells the Heavenly Father, I paid for those sins that Satan is accusing the brethren of. And not only so, I have transferred my divine righteousness by imputation to their account. And so God the Father declares acquitted, case dismissed. But the heavenly judge not only declares us to be innocent, but
but he declares us in fact, based on the doctrine of imputation, he declares us righteous. So let me summarize that so we don't forget the distinctions. Imputation deals with making us righteous. Justification deals with declaring us righteous. That is absolutely essential to understand as we look at the passage in James. But we see that the scripture uses justification in several different ways. Sometimes we see it used in relation to a divine declaration based on faith. And that's what we primarily find in the epistles of Paul, such as the book of Romans. Sometimes, however, we see it used of unrighteous people hypocritically trying to declare themselves righteous, such as in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. He goes down and has justified himself. He has declared himself to be righteous. Now, a declaration may be either true or false. When God declares something, it's always true. When man declares it, it may be either true or false. But there is a third way in which justification is used, and that is what we see in our passage, whereby something external declares the truth of something that is internal. Sometimes it's used of works, as in our passage this morning. And so let's go back and look at that for just a few moments. James in James chapter 2 verse 14 begins the discussion by saying, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? What's going on when a man says he has faith? Is he making himself righteous or is he declaring himself to be righteous? Obviously he's declaring himself to be righteous. He says, I have faith. I have faith. You know, I run into people all the time who claim to have faith. They say, well, we believe in God. Well, we'll jump to that one just very quickly down here. James talks about the man who says, uh, I believe in God. He says, thou sayest that thou, there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Believing in God is not enough. He right off the bat shoots down the arguments of those who claim to be on their way to heaven because they believe in God. Lots of people believe in God. That doesn't mean they're saved. A lot of people believe in a higher being. That does not believe that they are saved. That does not mean that they are saved. Thou doest well. The devil, devils also believe and tremble. We sang about that in our hymn this morning. Mighty fortress is our God. Folks, just saying you're saved doesn't make it so. And James is pointing out just saying you have faith doesn't make it so. That's how he starts the argument. Remember that as we get a little farther along. A man may say he has faith and have not works. Can faith save him? I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson like I did last week, but I'm just going to mention how this works. This is a special construction here. And it's, can that kind of faith save him? A faith that has no works attached to it. Can a verbalization of, yes, I believe, can that save a man if there is no resultant Action. That's what this discussion is about. That was his topic sentence. That's what introduces what's going to happen here in the rest of this passage. A man who has declared that he's a believer, but he has nothing to show for it in his life. Can that kind of a faith save a man? That's our question. Can the kind of a faith that never shows up in any way in a man's life can that kind of faith save a man? Now he begins his discussion in terms of practical things that everybody will understand. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body, what doth it profit? Now have you said pleasant words? Yes. Have you wished them well? Yes. Are they still naked and hungry and cold? 
Yes. He's trying to point out that saying things that are nice, saying things that are appropriate, saying things even that are biblical, means nothing if there is not corresponding action connected to it. That's illustration number one. And so he says, even so, paralleling that, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Just as your well-wishing without providing is dead because it is alone. It hasn't changed anything. It hasn't helped anybody else. And it goes on its merry way and forgets what it has just come across. But it feels good about itself because after all it did say some nice things to that one who had a need. A brother or sister, by the way. We don't have time to discuss it here, but there is a difference in Scripture very clearly set forth in Proverbs between the righteous poor and the wicked poor. The righteous poor, those who are brothers and sisters, who have needs, need to have those needs met by other believers. The wicked poor you never give anything to, and the Apostle Paul makes that very plain. He says, if any will not work, neither shall he eat. The Apostle Paul ran into the same problems that they saw in the Old Testament and that we see today. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. It's a very key verse, verse 18. You see, what he's saying here is that genuine faith always produces works of righteousness. Genuine faith is always visible. Genuine faith, which I cannot see, which is inside me or inside you, we cannot see each other's faith unless that faith becomes manifest in the visible world. Now, God can see faith in your heart. He can declare you righteous based on his observation of the faith that is in your heart. But if you want to demonstrate that to others, your faith must become visible. That's the argument that James is forwarding here. A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Okay, here is the question. Show me thy faith without thy works. Can you do it? Can you show someone else your faith? Can you show them you've truly trusted Christ without some kind of visible manifestation? How do we know, for example, that there was genuine faith in the heart of Martin Luther? How do we know, for example, that there was genuine faith in the heart of John Calvin? How do we know that there was genuine faith in the heart of Ulrich Zwingli? How do we know there was genuine faith in the heart of John Knox? Oh, go back further than that. How do we know that there was genuine faith in the heart of Stephen in Acts 7 is because it made itself manifest by what they did and their willingness to die for the truth of Scripture. Genuine faith always results, not sometimes, always results in works of righteousness that are what the scripture calls good works. Good works are always done in the power of the Holy Spirit, in obedience to the word of God, and in harmony with the word of God. Always for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for the glory of man. If it's contrary to scripture, it is not a good work. If it's done in the flesh, it's not a good work. If it's contrary to the Bible, it's not a good work. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. Faith comes first, works come second, but works will always show up when a man has genuine faith. Well, I believe in God. That's what we've talked about already. There's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, talking about you believe in God is not enough. 
Faith without works is dead. That is a dead kind of faith. That is not a genuine kind of faith. Genuine faith will result in a changed life. It will result in works. He gives the illustration. Was not our father Abraham justified by works? Now what are your definitions? Was he made righteous by his works or was he declared righteous by his works? You see, it makes all the difference in the world whether you understand the difference between justification and imputation. Abraham, in the sight of God, book of Romans, chapter 3 and 4, was declared righteous in the sight of God by faith and faith alone because God knows the heart. But here we're talking about men showing men whether they have faith or they don't have faith. The only way you can do it is by a visible manifestation of it. Abraham, our father, was justified by works. He was declared righteous by works. It proved his faith when he did what? When he had offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar. You remember that narrative that we read back in Genesis as we were going through the book of Genesis? God says to Abraham, okay, Abraham, now you've got your son, so now I want you to kill him. I want, I'm going to show you a mountain. I want you to take your son and I want you to go up there and sacrifice him. Did Abraham sit around for a week or two thinking maybe I had a bad pizza? Maybe, maybe uh, that wasn't, I, I got my wires crossed or something, I was confused in my vision or my dream or whatever. I, I better, better think about this and pray about it a while. No, it says the very next morning, and it says early in the morning, probably because Sarah was still asleep and I know she would probably have objected to the plan. Abraham got up early, he got Isaac up, took donkey with a bunch of sticks on it, took his knife, they headed for the hills, disappeared, until they came to the mountain that God would show him. And oh friends, what a mountain, there in Jerusalem, it doesn't say Jerusalem in the text. But that's where they ended up, we discover as we search the scriptures. The very place that Jesus would be sacrificed, the only begotten son of his father. You know, Isaac is called that even though there was also Ishmael. And Abraham built the altar. And he laid the wood on the altar. And Isaac in his innocence says, Father, here's the wood and here's the fire and here's the altar, but, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham responded in faith. My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. The sacrifice that God provided 2,000 years later in that place was himself, his son, to pay the penalty for our sins. The book of Hebrews cites that same incident as an incident of faith in the life of Abraham. And it says that he received Isaac again from the dead in a figure because he counted, and that's, look at some eye. He counted it, he figured it up, he reckoned it in his books that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead if he killed him. Because God had made a promise to him that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God hadn't given Isaac any kids yet. So if he killed Isaac, God who made all things, who made the miracle of Isaac being conceived in the old age of Sarah and Abraham and being born, God, to fulfill his promise, would have to raise Isaac from the dead. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go to Mount Moriah. I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac on the altar there. And so Abraham thought it over and he thought, you know, it's a long journey to go. It really doesn't make any sense because I, I trust God anyway. God's going to raise up seed through Isaac, 
So I don't have to go through the long journey. And I don't have to go through that laborious agony of me being a really old man, piling up a bunch of rocks and making an altar, and then trying to tie up a teenage boy, you know, and sticking him on top of the sticks on the altar, and then, you know, sticking him with my knife. I mean, because I believe God's going to raise up children through Isaac because he promised that to me, so I just guess I won't go because, after all, God's going to do that. So we'll just sort of pretend that we did it and say that we did. Would that have been an act of faith? No, of course not. How did Abraham prove his faith? How did Abraham demonstrate that he believed God? Because in faith he obeyed. In faith he walked forward. In faith he bound Isaac and placed him on the altar. And by faith he raised the knife over his dear only son from God's perspective. And God called from heaven, Abraham, Abraham! Vayomer, Hineni! Abraham, Abraham! And he said that as Abraham said, Vayomer, Hineni, behold me! Here am I! God withheld his hand. And Abraham looked. There's a ram with his horns caught in the thicket. God provided the sacrifice. Even as he had done for Cain, and Cain refused, but Abraham took it. You cannot prove your faith unless you obey. Faith without works is dead. That's a dead faith. You can go to a Bible preaching church all your life. You can sing the hymns, you can sing in the choir, you can participate on the board, you can do all these things that look so cool and neat and be lost and headed for hell. Genuine faith always translates into life action. Genuine faith always produces works of righteousness and works of righteousness are those works of obedience which God calls us to do. We're not saved by faith, but we can be justified by faith. Salvation is different than justification. Sozo, different Greek word. Remember doctrines of the cross. You've got a whole bunch of different things that deal with different aspects of what Jesus has done for us. Propitiation is not the same thing as remission. Propitiation means to turn aside God's wrath. Remission means the sending away of sins. They're interrelated, but they're distinct doctrines from one another, just like imputation is a distinct doctrine from justification. In the eyes of God, we are declared righteous because He sees it in our hearts. But no one else can see it there. If you say you have faith, you must prove it by your works. And that's the point that James is giving. Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. We are talking man to man. So he goes with Abraham. And notice what it says about Abraham. It says, Our father Abraham was justified. He's declared righteous by his works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? It made itself manifest by his works. And by, faith, by works was faith made perfect, made complete. It was a demonstration of the reality in the spiritual realm by showing forth in the visible realm. Now notice verse 23, because here's where he makes his contrast. Here he doesn't tie works to it. The scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed, that's faith. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. How was Abraham made righteous? You can be made righteous only one way. 
There are many declarations of righteousness, some which are true and some which are false, some which are claimed by hypocrites, and some which are manifest by believers by the way in which they obey the word of God. The making of Abraham righteous was at the point of faith. Abraham believed God and it was imputed, logizomai, unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And so he goes back to his theme. You see then how that by works a man is justified, that is, declared righteous and not by faith only. By faith in the sight of God justified, declared righteous, by the way in which our faith outworks itself in real life, we are declared righteous as a testimony to the watching world around us. Second illustration. Here's a woman who didn't have a lot of good works. She had only one. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified, that is declared righteous by works. Now, the rest of Rahab's works we won't discuss. She was a harlot. But it tells us what work proved that she believed. She had words. When the spies came in, she says, We have heard how your God has destroyed Og and Sihon, the kings of the Amorites, and man, our, our whole country is scared stiff of you guys. But it tells us what her works was that proved her faith. When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. She put her life on the line. She believed the true and living God of Israel. She says it with her mouth, but how do we know it's true? She just said, I really believe in you guys, God. Your, your God is, is the winning God. I mean, I know he's the big guy in this whole contest here. I know we're going to lose, but... Guys, I've got a business to run here. You know, uh, I, I, can't, I can't put you up overnight. You've got to go find someplace else to stay. What would that have said about her faith? It would have said she didn't have any. Instead, she received the spies. She hid them under the flax. The army came looking for them because somebody had tipped them off there at Rahab's house. She lied. Very infant faith. Flying is never right. But you also don't have to say anything. They weren't running off looking for the spies elsewhere. She let them down out of a cord in her window, said, Look, when you guys attack the city of Jerusalem, uh, Jericho, uh, you know, I'm going to have this red cord hanging out the window. And, you know, please spare my life because I spared your lives. And they said, Look, we'll take an oath and we promise we will not hurt anybody who's in your house. So get everybody who's going to be kept alive into your house because otherwise it's all over. And God made every part of that wall fall down except one. The section of the wall where Rahab's house was. And she was saved alive with all of her relatives in there. Rahab proved that she believed in the true and living God of Israel, that she was trusting him alone to care for her because she risked her life for it. How many of you are even willing to risk putting up one creationist poster? Faith without works is dead. I didn't say that. God said that. The Holy Spirit said it through the pen of James. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Do you see the parallel? You know, we would have probably paralleled faith with spirit and body with works, but he doesn't. He parallels the body with faith and the works with no faith. For as the body, there's faith. Without the Spirit, works is dead. So faith without works is dead also. Dear friends, this is Reformation Sunday. We enjoy reading church history. 
We enjoy looking back at the glorious times when men and women were fleeing for their lives and we get all excited. We read novels about it. We read history books about it. We look at all the paintings that have been made about it. We watch videos about it. And then we go back to living our humdrum lives that never manifest faith. That's the heart of the Reformation. We are the children of the Reformation. You are not saved by faith. Excuse me, you are not saved by works. You are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, by God's grace alone. And God sees your heart and he justifies you by faith. And sanctification is by faith also, not by works. But faith without works is dead. It's a worthless kind of faith to have. Genuine faith, remember, always, always, produces works of righteousness. Works that are good works in obedience to the word of God, to the glory of God, in the power of the spirit of God and not in the power of the flesh and not to the glory of man. Works that bring glory to God because they show you believe the word of God and you're willing to lay down your life for it. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word in its declaration, oh, how we love to declare the theoretical doctrine of justification by faith. Because it never seems to reach down to our lives where we are right now. Father, you can see our hearts. You know whether faith is there or not. There may be somebody sitting here today who thinks that he or she is saved. That he or she has faith because they believe in God. Or they think that maybe they've trusted in Jesus and they're resting on that. But... There's been no transformation, no regeneration of the Spirit, no eagerness in bursting forth as a seed that is planted that is a, that is a living seed. And when it's watered, it begins to grow and it shows up. But we plant rocks and water them all we want. It'll never grow. Nothing will ever sprout out of the ground. But a living seed will always grow. It will always show itself above the ground. It may be trampled. It may be cut. And persecution does that to us, Father. But if it's a living seed, it is going to grow above the ground. It is going to show forth its head. There will be leaves that grow on it. And if it is a fruit-bearing plant, it will bear fruit. Because your Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of those who are saved. It's not our works. It's the work of the Spirit of God as He manifests Himself in us through the fruit of the Spirit, through the exercise of the gifts that have been given, through obedience to the Word of God, in spite of harassment, in spite of mockery, in spite of the danger, in spite of the hard work, it will manifest itself and become visible. Father, I pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth this day, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.